Welcome to Magnolia United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Brad Chamberlain, and this is our service for June 26th, 2022. I am back from a bout of COVID, feeling better, but man, what a time we're in right now. For the main topic of our service today, let me just get a little introduction going. We are called to be a people of love serving Christ through the strength of the Holy Spirit in bringing about the transformation of our society such that each person beloved by God is in community, is treated with love and care, and is moving towards fullness of life. And this word love is such a thick concept that we can talk about it in general terms forever. We need to get to where we aren't just talking about it in our lives, but are living it out through our lives and that we are communicating this love through our lives. And this communication brings us back to the series we were starting way back in May, <laughs> before the Uvalde and Buffalo shootings brought the gun violence issue to the forefront, and we took the diversion to look at Micah chapter 4 for a few weeks there. We are looking at the universal nature of God's love and of God's reign, for the next couple of weeks, I will be focusing on the importance of language, our own language and the language of others, in building up community and in communicating love. And so today, in the message, we are focusing on a very basic question, which I don't believe is asked all that often. What is the language of Christianity? And guess what? Long story short, it all is going to come back to love. But first, there is a lot going on in our world right now. It is, it's a hard time to process, to not just be angry or worried or scared or, or maybe for some people happy about some of the things or, I don't know, it's just a jumble of emotions, the what ifs, the what is going on. We are a divided people. And we are a divided church in regards to how our faith intersects with all of these issues. I could teach on any number of the issues that are out right now, but I feel that it's, it's too easy for each of us to twist the scriptures to fit our own beliefs about the issues. It's just not clear. We can all defend what we're thinking based on scripture. And we've all heard all the arguments ad nauseum. Some parts of the news cycle right now might be cause for some in our body, in the wider church body, in our country as a whole, to celebrate. And some might be cause for anger and sorrow. We as believers, regardless of where we fall on our understanding of these issues, are still, especially now, we're still called to look in all of this to God. We are to seek Christ's face. We are to seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And we are to act through God's love as ministers of that love in the hurting world around us. And this world is hurting and it needs people of compassion, of love. Rather than pray specifically about any of these many issues, I've listed, I'm going to list some of them topically. And I ask that we each wherever you are, take some time to lift up the issue in your own heart and our nation and the world up to God. Take time to recommit to trusting God with it all and to empower us to refocus on being agents of love and transformation towards God's reign on earth as it is in heaven. I will read out a topic now, and I ask that you spend some time expressing to God your emotions, your heart, but then also commit that issue to God. Commit your trust to God and ask God to show you how to respond. How can I best be love in this situation? After a bit of time, I will say, Lord, have mercy. And you can reply, Christ, have mercy. And then I'll state the next topic area. Gun violence.
Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Women's rights, reproductive health, and the issues surrounding abortion. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. The war in Ukraine. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Racial injustice. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. For our LGBTQ plus sisters and brothers, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. For issues surrounding COVID. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Amen. Join me together in today's opening prayer. Holy, creating, creative God, we speak from the depths of our sorrow. We speak from the abundance of our joy. We speak in voices separate and unique. We speak with one voice as your body. May the words of our mouths, whether in speech or song, and the meditations of our hearts, whether in prose or poetry, be pleasing in your sight. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of humans and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see only a reflection, as in a mirror. But then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love remain, these three, and the greatest of these is love. With hearts of sorrow, we come before you, God, to confess what you already know. We have failed to keep your laws. Again and again, we have fo followed our own selfish will rather than your holy and life-giving will for our lives. We have twisted your decrees and institutions to suit our preconceptions and interests rather than your own. Forgive us, O oh God, and cleanse us from hidden faults that the words of our mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts may be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. 
And now let's each just confess our sins where we are. Receive the words of assurance. God shows steadfast love and blesses to the thousandth generation those who walk in God's ways. In love, God sent Jesus to bless and redeem God's people. God forgives our sins and restores each of us to, know, to new, full life. Amen. Offering may be given by check to the address shown on the screen or online at the at umcmagnolia.com. Let's join together thanking God for this week's offering. Everlasting God of all provision, thank you that you are the light of the world, guiding our steps on your path. Your word says that the earth is yours and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to you. We recognize everything we have belongs to you. We acknowledge that our very lives belong to you. We now offer back to you a portion of what you have given us. May God prepare our journey. May Jesus guide our footsteps. And may the Holy Spirit watch over us on every path that we follow. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our reading today is from Psalms, chapter 19, verses 1 to 14. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey them. How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me that I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So today I want to talk about language and translation a bit. To get us started, let me ask, what is the language of Christianity? Let's step back a bit and revisit Pentecost, which we celebrated a few weeks ago. On Pentecost, the Spirit descends like tongues of flames on the group of followers, right? Those followers who had gathered together in Jerusalem to celebrate Shavuot, the festival of weeks. They gathered together, their first time really coming out of hiding as a group, following Christ's crucifixion back on Passover 50 days earlier. And now they're here together again to celebrate the next important Jewish festival together. And the Jews from other areas outside of Jerusalem, even from other countries, all would travel to Jerusalem at this time for the festival. So this group of Christ's followers were together and the Spirit came and started speaking in languages they didn't know. But people walking by from other countries, they heard their words and they understood those words says that each person heard them speaking in their own language, and as outsiders, they were puzzled, asking, 
And how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? And, long story short, hearing their own languages spoken when they were foreigners in this place, it drew those visitors in. It made a connection. And the visiting Jews gathered, listening to these Galileans speaking in these other languages, speaking in their, the visitors' own languages. And then Peter addresses the crowd and teaches them. And it says that more than 3,000 joined the church that day. Jews from all countries where, they, where Jews lived at the time were among them. And these 3,000 were baptized. And so we might ask, <laughs> what language were the Galileans speaking when the Spirit descended upon them? It wasn't nonsense, and it wasn't anything singular. Whatever they were speaking, each person walking by understood it as their own language. Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, it says. There's a mystery here in which God's message of love through Christ is empowered by the Holy Spirit such that each person understands it intimately and individually. Not just in a language that they understand, like a trade language, say Greek, or their religious language, Hebrew, but that message of love comes to each person individually in the language of their heart. And so Hebrew was the language of Judaism. What is the language of Christianity? We're going to focus on the book of Mark for our messages this week and next week. What language or languages did Jesus speak? It seems like that's a good place to figure out what language, what the language of Christianity is. So here we go. Did Jesus speak English? After all the saying goes, if the King James Version of the Bible was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. <laughs> of course not. English didn't even exist as a language for many centuries after Jesus' time. Israel was occupied by the Roman Empire. So, did Jesus speak Latin? Jesus would have known a few Latin words related to the empire, like centurion and other military words and denarius, and other financial words. But they would have just been words. Greek was the lingua franca of Palestine and the Roman Empire. Did Jesus speak Greek? Quite likely Jesus did speak Greek, although it wasn't his primary language. When Jesus spoke to Pilate, they almost, all, they almost certainly spoke to one another in Greek. Pilate wouldn't have used Jesus' language, but Jesus would have needed to shift to Pilate's language. And the New Testament, eventually, it was written in Greek. But Jesus was not a native speaker of Greek. We mentioned Hebrew earlier. Hebrew is the language of the Jewish scriptures and faith. Jews from all over, no matter what they spoke as their native language, used scriptures written in Hebrew and used the Hebrew language for religious functions. And we know that Jesus was able to read from the Torah and teach in the temples, which would have been done in Hebrew. But still... Hebrew. It was not his native language. And last in this little survey of Jesus's languages is Aramaic, which was the everyday language of the home and of society in Palestine. Aramaic was the language Jesus grew up spoke, speaking with Mary and Joseph, with his mom and dad. It's the language he spoke with his disciples and friends. It's most certainly the language in which he did most of his teaching. Aramaic was Jesus's primary language. So, if Aramaic was Jesus's language, why isn't Aramaic the language of Christianity? We will find that there are four instances where Mark preserves Jesus's Aramaic in his book, but we will address the significance of those instances next week. For now, let's just notice that Mark wrote his gospel in Greek, same language as the rest of the New Testament, why, throughout the Gospel, did Mark choose not to record Jesus' actual words, but instead translated them? And again, next week, we will contrast this with, the, with why Mark chooses to leave the original Aramaic of Jesus' words untranslated in four instances. 
a 20th century liberal Scottish Old Testament scholar named James Barr. He was known for his contribution on how vocabulary and structure of the Hebrew language may reflect a particular theological mindset. He wrote the following, quote, One of the peculiarities of Christianity is that the words of Jesus have not been preserved in the language in which they were originally spoken. Even from the earliest days, there was no great effort, perhaps there was no effort at all, to ensure that his sayings should be kept alive in the original tongue. The tradition of his teaching was carefully cultivated and was set forth in the various versions of the different Gospels, but it was a tradition in translation. Right from the beginning, the original language of Christianity was not any singular earthly language. It was not Greek or Hebrew or even Jesus' language Aramaic. Rather, translation is the original language of Christianity. Translation is inherent in Christianity from the start. It's not some new idea to translate the Bible. It is, it's there right from the beginning. We find it in Mark's writing, and we find it in the story of Pentecost. And this is certainly peculiar among the world's religions. Mark and the other New Testament authors understood that in Christ's message of God's love, it's not the words that matter. It's the underlying reality which the words represent. Words are temporal. They are temporal pointers to a deeper reality. In our reading from 1 Corinthians 13 today, in, chapter, in verse 12, we read, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. These words, these words point to a deeper reality. It's not about the words. It's what's underlying them. Not just a reflection pointing to reality, but they're about the reality itself. It is intimate and individualized communication. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. It's not the words that matter. It's the underlying reality which the words represent. So let's just take, for example, of another religion, the Tibetan Buddhist scriptures, which were written down in a variety of Tibetan around 600 AD. That language, like all languages, has changed significantly over the centuries, and now there are anywhere from 120 to 220 different languages spoken on earth today, which relate back to that same ancestral language, which is archived in Buddhist scriptures. In these Tibetan areas, the spoken language of the individual is viewed as profane and is meant for everyday life, but is never to be the language of the holy. For that, the ancient language is used. The holy language is used. Holy texts can only be written in that language. When the priests, the lamas, as they're called, when, they, when the lamas pray, it has to be in that language. And the people believe that the words themselves, the shape of the word, the sound of the word, in that form has power. It is a holy language for them. If a lama is sharing a message, the power of the message isn't, it, it, the power of the message is in being exposed to the words and is not related so much to the meaning behind those words. In this which is actually somewhat a more typical scenario of a holy language associated with a faith. It's not so much the meaning of the words which matters, it is the words themselves. The same dynamic is also found throughout Islam and in relation to the Arabic language. Christianity, though, was never to be associated with a singular language. There is no singular language, there's no sacred language in Christianity. The specific words spoken by Jesus at the Sermon of the Mount are not the point. Rather, the meaning behind them is. It's all about the meaning, not the words themselves. As Christians, we should never get hung up on specific words or phrases or even languages. That's not what is important here. Rather, we look to the meaning behind those words. The key in Christianity is that God's love, as presented through Jesus Christ, 
is being intimately communicated to each individual. It's all about each of us individually getting to know God, even as we read in 1 Corinthians, as we are each fully individually known. Which means it's all about relationship. God created us for relationship. And because we were created for relationship, we are wired. We are wired in our innermost being to find fulfillment and fullness of life in relationship. This again points us back to the events at Pentecost, where the miracle of the Holy Spirit inspired of the Holy Spirit inspired languages. That miracle is all about building relationship. God created us for relationship with God, with one another, and with all of creation. And intimate relationship requires intimate communication. And intimate communication requires intimate language. And so God values intimate communication with each person on earth through the languages we each speak. And so, due to the dynamics I talked about earlier in Tibetan Buddhism, or in Islam, translation is not acceptable in those, in those religions. The holiness of those scriptures is bound to the sacred value of the original languages. But in Christianity, translation is not only acceptable, it's not only acceptable to translate the good news, it is essential. Because it is God's mission to be in intimate relationship with each person to be known intimately with each person throughout the earth. And this sought-after relationship of shalom, this fullness of relationship, is not just between individuals and God and God and individuals. It is between each of us as well. The language of this relationship, the language of Christianity, is love translated for each individual. Again, from our reading in 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And this sought-after relationship of shalom is not just between God and us, and between us people as well. It is also including all of creation in the mix of intimate relationship. In our psalm reading today, we read... The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. This message being communicated intimately to each individual from God through the words of our scriptures, from the heavens, from all of creation, from one another. It's the message of love. It is not mere words. It is the reality behind our words, which is at the heart of Christianity, endlessly communicating love in intimate relationship. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Christ is, Christ himself is, in fact, God's infinite love, translated for each of us into the language of our hearts the message of God's love incarnate on earth. That's who Jesus is. And this translated love is the sacred language of our faith. Next week, we will look at the four times when Mark chooses to preserve Christ's Aramaic words and use this to talk about the dignity of the individual and the power of our heart language, our home language, our mother tongue in communicating and receiving God's love. And now let's pray together as Jesus taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Receive the benediction. Go now into the world, inspired by the extravagant love of God. Live generously, with open hands, loving one another as if your lives depended on it. Be good stewards of the gifts you have received, so that God may be glorified in all you say and do. May your words and your actions translate God's love into the world, and may the abundant love of God surround you. May the extravagant grace of Jesus Christ sustain you, and may the constant presence of the Holy Spirit inspire, empower, and encourage you in every good deed and word. Amen. Okay, we'll see you next week.